to this training. Um, this is one of the trainings for the Compass Project, and this is specifically for service group training. This is for CDDPs, brokerages, and providers. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what technology we're going to use today. So you'll see that all of us presenters have our cameras off. So feel free to have your cameras off if you'd like. Um, one of the things that we found in previous recordings is that if the presenters have their cameras on, it's a little distracting in the recording. So we're going to go ahead and have them off today. If you want yours on, feel free. If not, don't worry about it. Um, but one of the other things that we will be doing is having everybody muted throughout the training. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that we have found that when questions get put in the chat box early on in the presentations, we sometimes miss them and we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we get to everybody's questions. And the other one is, is that as we're going throughout this presentation and you find that you have questions that might get answered later on. But we definitely will have a question and answer session at the end of this presentation. So next, we're going to look at guidelines for participation today and creating a comfortable environment. Um, we realize that this is not in person. It's online. It's virtual. So it definitely has pros and cons. But I think that the guidelines still apply. So this is all going to this might be some new information for you. It might be review for others. But as we're going through, um, we'll all listen with an open mind, be present and engaged, respectful of others, um, honor each other's time and space, and focus on what we can control and influence, and take care of yourself throughout. Um, we may need a break in the middle, and we can certainly do that. If you guys need to step away from your computer during the presentation, feel free to do that. Do what you need to do to take care of yourself today. And then to get the most out of the session today, we're our suggestions are to attend the entire session. So we will have the presentation and the Q&A at the end. Um, you have access to the participant guide link in the chat. So feel free to download that and follow along. There may be information um, that is a little bit harder to see on the slide, but is available in your participant guide. And if you print those off, you're more than welcome to take notes. People have found that pretty helpful in the past. And then um, participate fully in discussions in the Q&A. And we do have some thoughts around how to um, share your questions. And so we'll have more information about that later. And then we also have a post course evaluation. And this is important on our side of it because we are always trying to improve the training that we're developing for the field. And so uh, it would be great if everybody could, you know, take five minutes and complete that. We'll, we'll leave some time at the end of the training today for you to do that. So let's move on and talk about the agenda. <clears throat> so today, the agenda, we're going to cover the Compass and Service Group, group framework and background um, and framework and payment categories. We're going to provide lots of resources and we'll talk about next actions, which includes training. And then we're going to wrap up uh, and finish with a question and answer session. And so your subject matter experts today are Mike Parr and Rose Herrera. They are from ODDS. And my name is Teresa Knowles, and I'm also with ODDS, not the subject matter expert on what we're covering today, but helping facilitate this training. So I'm going to hand it over to Rose to cover service group framework, or it might be Mike, sorry. Thanks, Teresa. It is Mike. Uh, hi, everybody. Mike Parr I'm from ODDS. And I am going to talk to you today about what we're calling the service group framework. What service groups are, are a way to connect people to resources based on their levels of need. Uh, today, and for a while now, every time that an ONA is submitted, Express does a calculation and a service group is assigned to the person. There is an algorithm in the ONA that based on answers to some of the questions there, calculates and assigns the service group. Um, we've been actually doing this for a couple of years now. Uh, we've been using the assigned service groups uh, as data to inform policy decisions that we've been making 
uh, again, for the last couple of years. Uh, and relatively recently, you may have noticed that uh, you can now see uh, service groups in Express if you have the right permissions. And there's a transmittal and an Express help guide that will show you how to do that if you don't already know. Um, what a service group is fundamentally is a measurement of the amount of support a person needs. So basically people in the same service group need similar levels of support, not the same kind of support necessarily, but in the same amount. It's gonna look very different for different people, uh, but the resources that are allocated through the service group should be enough to meet those person's needs in most cases. Um, for people in an in-home program, support is measured in hours per month of supports available. And for other types of service, support is measured in a rate paid to the provider. Uh, I wanna take a second to emphasize that the only thing that's changing on July 1st is rates. In-home hours are not changing on July 1st. They will, the ONA service groups will apply to in-home hours sometime in 2023. But for today, let's try and focus mostly on provider rates that are going into effect on July 1st. So service groups are a way of matching people with similar levels of support needs to a corresponding level of resources. We believe the framework is valid and reliable across all residential settings and age groups. This results in a consistent way of determining payment categories and our allocations. The framework improves the equity of services by assuring resources are distributed fairly. But before we really dive into service groups, let's talk a little bit about why we were doing this. Um, for those of you who have been around a while, you have seen a lot of changes in the DD system in Oregon, uh, especially from my perspective, starting in 2013. That's when we started the K plan, plan of care. Uh, we had a change in leadership at ODDS. So a lot of things happened then that have led to a system in Oregon that has gotten complicated and confusing. Uh, we feel our values aren't well expressed through the system that we have now. So Compass is part of an effort that we all are making as a whole, not just ODDS, but you know the entire stakeholder community to reorient the DD system here. It will focus as much as possible on individualized, equitable, person-centered services and supports and a more transparent system. The Compass Project is reforming the system to be more person-centered, simple, and transparent. Uh, you should expect to hear these words often in the future because all of Compass's efforts are directed towards those goals. We are instituting accountability measures to assure that the resources we have are supporting the goals of the project and improving the lives of people getting our services. Compass will result in consistent application of policy, but also will recognize that we are working in a human services field with real people and it needs to be flexible. So we are trying as hard as we can to build flexibility in. And then for especially people in 24 hour residential services, giving them more flexibility and creativity with their services through something called unbundling, which is not something we'll talk about a lot today, but there will be future trainings coming up on that topic that Teresa will tell you about later on. What we want is a system that will be there for Oregonians when they need it, a system that is easy to access, easy to navigate within, and with guaranteed self-determination and personal choice in the services we provide. It will support equal opportunity for living options and meaningful employment in an integrated community setting. So let's take a look at the areas that the Compass is focusing on. Teresa, you're one side ahead of me, thank you. So Compass focuses on three areas, they're all very interconnected, but for the, um, you know, for simplicity and the ability to talk about the project, we've split them into three areas. There is the ISP redesign. Uh, Aniko Adani is leading this effort for ODDS, so look for opportunities to participate in work groups and other things coming in the future. So ISP redesign is one area. The Oregon needs assessment is another area. Uh, you're I'm sure already familiar with it. It's been used uh, for a while now as the functional needs assessment and level of care. Um, in some settings, it's the risk identification tool. Uh, a week ago or so, you may have noticed that now it assesses um, individual eligibility for enhanced PSWs. Uh, and as time goes on, it will do more and more things for us. 
And then there's the service group framework and payment categories. Um, this is what we're primarily gonna focus on today. Uh, but before we can get there, Compass has some new words, terms that you'll wanna start getting used to hearing. And so let's talk about how those relate to today's world. Um, we talked about Compass as change and it is change, but there is some familiar concepts. Um, so today where you have CIS tiers that set rates for 24 hour residential and some employment services, CIS tiers are gonna be replaced by payment categories. There are six tiers. There will be four payment categories. Um, you may be asking, oh, what about tier seven? Uh, tier seven essentially is just exceptions to rates uh, and exceptions to rates will continue to be available where appropriate. For determining rates today, we use the SIS, the SNAP, the ONA, Supported Living Budget Tool. Um, eventually, uh, the owner is gonna replace all of those things. On July 1st, it's gonna replace the SIS. We will continue to do the SNAP and the Supported Living Budget Tool. Um, hopefully the Supported Living Budget Tool will be replaced relatively soon. We're working on that. Uh, the SNAP, we have to continue until we can work out um, a, a, an agreement with the union. The SNAP is included in the foster care collective bargaining agreement. And so we can't move forward with using the ONA until we resolve that. Uh, today, when a service is assigned, you all know you go into plan of care and enter a rate. Uh, that will be a thing of the past for most of these services. Um, for agencies, rates will be auto-populated in Express. You will authorize the service. Express knows what the provider should be paid. Uh, there will be things called add-ons. Add-ons are those exceptional rates. So Express knows what a, for example, supported living or a um, small group employment provider should be paid, uh, but maybe they're serving somebody with unique needs and the rate needs to be enhanced. That will be done through the use of an add-on. So add-on is a term that you'll hear more and more as time goes on. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, 24 hour residential providers in general um, if a person needs direct nursing services, that 24-hour residential provider provides those. Same with behavior, professional behavior supports. Um, starting July 1st, the 24-hour residential provider will be responsible for the attendant care, the, the in-home care, and behavior and direct nursing services are going to be provided by whomever the individual chooses to have them provided by. It could be the 24-hour residential provider or it could be an, uh, another provider. So let's take a look next at how resources flow from the ONA. So like I mentioned, an ONA is conducted, Express calculates and assigns a service group, and then the resources people need to live their lives are allocated. Uh, resources for in-home programs, like I mentioned, are in hours, not changing July 1st. For programs like residential services and employment, resources are measured in rates paid to providers. We use the service group framework as a way of determining payment categories for a lot of agency type services and our allocations for people getting in-home services. The framework is valid and reliable across residential types and age groups. Uh, we've worked on this for a long time with a number of uh, you know, from members across the developmental disabilities community in Oregon, as well as independent contractors. Uh, we are confident this results in a consistent way of determining payment categories and our allocations. And we believe the framework improves the equity of services by assuring resources are distributed fairly. So let's talk about how the ONA and service group framework contribute to transparency and consistency. So like I said, those are some of our goals, transparency and consistency. Um, the Today, you know, if a uh, ANA is conducted and it spits out an hour allocation, it's really hard to know where that comes from. Um, when a CIS tier is assigned to somebody, it's hard to know how that rate was determined. Um, through the Compass project, we've changed all of that. Um, Rose will talk about payment categories and rate methodologies in a minute and where to find those and how to understand them. But for as far as the ONA goes, um, what we've started to do is to make it obvious how a person lands in a service group. Um, the algorithm behind the scenes in the ANA was never well known. It's going to be for the ONA published in an administrative rule. It will be very clear to see what factors go towards 
a person's service group. Um, we intend annual, whenever an ONA will be conducted in the future, there are reports available in Express that we are going to expect case managers to provide to individuals. Those reports show, there's a couple different ones. One is a summary of the ONA that shows of the questions that contribute to a service group assignment, how they were scored. There's another report we call the comparison report that will compare one ONA to another for one person. So if something has changed, if a service group has gone up or down, uh, the individual and their case manager can see exactly which questions changed. Um, so yeah, it, it will be easy for a person to understand how they got assigned to the service group that they got assigned to much more clearly than it is today. So now that we've talked about how we got here, let's look at the service groups themselves. So you can see them here. Um, having a service group framework like this puts resources where they're needed in an appropriate and fair amount. Uh, you can see uh, service groups are assignments are divided into four age cohorts. We have infant, toddler, child, adolescent, and adult. And then within each of those age cohorts are a different number of service groups. Uh, for adults and adolescents, you can see they range from very low to very high. Uh, those are the terms that we'll try to use, although you will see um, them expressed as one through five sometimes. Uh, Express uses one through five. Uh, but just know that very low corresponds to one, very high to five. Um, we want you to understand how these work because you have the most contact with people who are affected by the service group. But just understand and know that as part of the rollout of this whole thing, there will be training specifically targeted towards people and families regarding the ONA. Uh, and we'll go into more detail about the service groups, how they can understand them and how they can learn more. Uh, it, but it is important for you to understand so that you can answer questions from the field as much as possible. So now let's talk about how this relates to payment categories. I'm gonna turn it over now to Rose Herrera. Good morning. So as Mike spoke about our service groups, we then have to look at how do we allocate resources for people who are receiving those provider agency services. Um, and so for example, that's gonna be our 24 hour residential, some of our employment services in DSA, and how do we translate service groups into what we call payment categories. And basically what we've done is we've compressed service groups one and two into payment category one. And the reason we do that is when we look at the resources that are needed to provide supports to people in that very low and low service group of one and two, those resources are very, very, very similar when we look at it delivered through that provider agency model. So one and two translate to payment category one, and then our three moderate is payment category two, Four, our high payment category is payment category three, and the five very high translates to payment category four. So it's really just a quick, you know, take your service group minus one, unless it's the one and two, and they're gonna be in payment category one. And that's how that breaks down. Um, and then you're gonna see some additional breakdown when we look at 24 hour services, because there is um, some consideration for capacity of the home, but the payment categories are there, it's just then, there's a breakdown of those capacity levels. Um, so the other thing um, we wanna mention is our implementation of these changes. So we have the service groups, we have the payment categories. So if we can get that next slide. Our implementations of changes are as follows. We've actually put the new rate model into effect for our children's 24-hour residential. Um, through this process, we were able to learn a lot of what works, what doesn't, and kind of work out some of those um, you know, growing pains that come with change to prepare us for the rollout for the adults. Um, we also uh, went ahead and launched our host home rate models at the same time. So these changes have been done and they have that ONA based service group and payment category structure in place. Um, next, we're looking at our implementation for July 1st. With July 1st, um, we have our 24 hour residential settings for adults. We have transportation, we have day support activities and we have employment services. So quite a big transition on that July 1st of this year. And then our next category is the to be determined. These are ones that will eventually 
have that Compass project ONA based service rate, but there's a lot of kind of components that need to be considered. So for example, supported living is kind of a unique model and we have to look at what makes the most sense as we make sure that people have those necessary services that they need for that kind of independent living or that usually people living by themselves and having a provider come in and provide them support. And how does that look as far as um, allocating resources? Um, is, Mike mentioned, you know, with our adult foster homes, we have collective bargaining, um, our child foster homes, then we also want to kind of align in a similar way. Um, and then we have our in-home attendant care hours as well, which is really the majority of people receiving services. So we know it's a, a large impact. We want to make sure that we're doing it very thoughtfully and in a way that, again, enhances services for people. So that's our essential rollout. The big date to be focused on is our preparation for July 1st. And then knowing those areas which feel like they're untouched, we're working on them. They're just coming later. So I wanna go ahead and give an example of our residential uh, setting situation since that's one of our uh, rate models that's gonna be implemented starting in July. So our example is with Mateo. He lives in a residential home with two other gentlemen. When he was younger, he was very independent. But you know, as he's aged, he's needed some more support, um, maybe more cueing, some physical support, those type of things. So his recent ONA shows his increased support needs. So he has a new service category, or new service group, which then results in a change in payment category. So if we look at that, he went from a payment category two to a three, which means his service group went from a three to a four. So he had moderate support needs and now his support needs are considered high and he's in that service group, or I'm sorry, payment category three. With that um, new assessment means that there's more resources to help him so that he still has that ability to self-direct and be as independent as possible, but he gets the necessary support where needed. So next we're gonna look at resource allocation as I was speaking about resources a moment ago. And um, if we look at the service groups, they have the in-home in hour allotments and most provider rates. And service groups, again, determine payment categories. But now we're gonna look at those capacity components for service groups and payment categories. So again, like I mentioned earlier, we have the four payment categories, and then we have a breakdown in our 24 hour for adult services of one to three residents and four to five residents. So again, you have your one through four based on the service groups. And there's gonna be kind of like a table of, of rates and um, assumptions of hours, those type of things that are gonna be for those one to three resident homes. And then you're gonna have the four to five resident homes have their own grid and rates associated. So this just looks at our uh, staffing assumptions for our one to three capacity homes. Um, so this is just kind of a, a, a rough working framework to look at how resources um, can support people in the home. One of the concepts that we have is called a shared daily staffing hours. What this basically means is this is the amount of hours that really go towards maintaining that minimum level of staffing, meaning there's always a staff on and present in the home. And then from that, we look at those additional hours that could likely be used as one-to-one -one support for that individual as well. So you get the shared staffing, you get some one-on-one -on, -one on top of that, and that's where that total daily st staffing hours works. Um, I do wanna really point out that this is, this is a kind of a general concept. We realize there's gonna be some fluctuation there. Um, there might be a home where everybody is out of the home at the same time for maybe a day program or employment. And so maybe there's gonna be a chunk of time where there's not a staff in the home, maybe somebody's kind of on standby um, and then hours are more concentrated at another time or that staffing can fluctuate throughout a week or a month depending on schedules and service needs and those type of things. Um, so again, the service groups are the breakdown here, but then they translate to the payment category. So you'll always see that the service group one and two will have the same numbers. 
Um, so for the staffing assumptions for the four to five home, it looks a little differently. And you'll notice those shared staffing hours are a little lower. And part of that was um, looking at more people in the home to share those resources, as well as looking at individuals with those very low and low um, support needs that there's generally going to be time where they're not getting staffing support. Um, and so that's why those numbers look quite a bit different. So how do staffing patterns translate to real situations? That's what we'll talk about next. So we have a couple examples. So let's say in this situation, we have four people and we have kind of a diversity of needs. So we've got an individual who has that moderate, and then we've got a person who has high, another person who has high and very high. So we take their total hours per day of support in that staffing assumption. We add that together and that gives us about 44 hours per day. So per 24 hours day for how we're gonna work those hours for staffing. Um, and the next slide is then gonna look at, we look at the total support and we can essentially cover five and a half, eight hour shifts. But again, we have lots of flexibility. And the next slide is gonna show us some examples of how that could break down. So here's three options. These aren't the only options. These are just to give an illustration of, of how those hours might be adjusted depending on the needs. So with option A, maybe you have a really active daytime um, support. Maybe in the morning, people are getting that support, getting ready for day programs and activities. And then we have three staff really in that midday to late afternoon. And maybe that's a real key time for some community integration activities or some other support that really just takes a lot more focus and dedication, as well as people just making those transitions as they maybe transition home. And then we just need one person at night because maybe we have a really steady nighttime routine where we just need someone to kind of check in, respond, and give that kind of general support at night. Um, option two looks really similar. It's just a little more consistent with the numbers in the daytime. And then option three is really a more just kind of a steady around the clock staffing example as well. But again, I really want to reiterate this. There's no you must do A, you must do B, you must do C. These are just examples of how you could potentially break down those resources. Again, we're looking at not auditing every single day, are you doing these exact hours? It's more of a, in general, this is how the hours or the resources that are funded for this person. And we realize there's gonna be fluctuation during the week. Oftentimes there's a difference between weekdays and weekends. Um, maybe it's throughout the month. Um, maybe you're doing a lot of support to prepare somebody for a visit home. And then there's kind of some downtime where you're not staffing that person. But then when they come back, there's some really intense support that's needed um, to help them transition back to the home. So you're going to see that kind of ebb and flow of staffing support that's needed. So again, I really want to reemphasize there is a lot of flexibility. These are just illustrations of different ways that you might want to structure those hour supports to address the needs of the individuals and the home in general. Um, one of the things that we are going to do, though, is we were going to look at staffing summaries when we look at exceptions. This just really gives us a picture of how resources are currently being used in the home um, and helps us understand where some gaps or needs might be. So this just really helps to paint that picture. So in most cases, when we are looking for an exception for an individual, we do want to see that the... Um, how the resources are being used. Um, our exceptions are gonna be based on individual need and not necessarily by how someone wants to operate a program, like as in a general, this is just how we run things, but based on this individual and this home situation, here's why we need this exception and here's how resources are currently being used. So it just again, paints that full picture to give that explanation and allow for us to kind of do that evaluation as we look at exceptions. Um, there will be more training about exceptions as well. And Therese is gonna be talking about additional resources and next actions. All right, thanks Rose. So we talked earlier today or in this presentation about some additional training that we're gonna run through. Um, on here on the left column, we have the title of the training. In the middle is the audience. And then on the far right is a targeted date of delivery. And one of the things that I really wanna point out is that the material in the trainings will be focused on this particular audience, but anybody can attend any training that they would like. So if um, a person receiving services or their family want additional information on exceptions or unbundling, they're more than welcome to participate in this 
Wellness Training, or if you'd like to, to attend the Oregon Needs Assessment Training for People and Families in April, that's fine too. Um, so we have some exceptions training coming up, um, an unbundling training. This one is on professional behavior services and background. We have one on the Oregon needs assessment specifically for providers, but again, anybody can attend. Then we also have um, bundling on, this is direct nursing services specifically. And the next one is unbundling um, uh, specifically for professional behavior services. And those are the 16th and 17th. And then we have an ONA training for people and families. This will actually be the second one that we have rolling out on April 6th. The other thing that I wanna point out again is that all of these are gonna be recorded and found on our website, which we will get to in just a second. So we will also have these additional trainings available in Workday by the end of March. So the exceptions training will be a module in Workday as well as an employment specific exceptions training. And then we will also have a specific um, Compass 100 overview training for vocational rehabilitation and how that um, affects them. And then later in May, we're gonna have more of that billing express training. Uh, so that will be rolling out. Those will be uh, webinars available and you'll also be able to find those on our website. And then we'll also have additional training um, on billing for employment, transportation and all that. And then in July, we will have a combination of webinars and online modules that will be in Workday and available um, you know, for a refresher or if there are new people coming into your organization, they can certainly take that. So this is the Compass Project website. So this is the overview. This is the main page. If you look in the on the menu on the left and down here where it says training center, if you click on that, that's going to take you to the actual training center where we have a list of trainings that are coming up. So you'll see what month it is, what month the training will be held, the name of it when it will be, um, a course description, and then all audiences. And one of the things that you'll see on there, if you click on there now, um, is that it will have links for registration. The difference is, is that any trainings uh, that are specific to people with IDD and their families will not require registration in Workday. It's just a Zoom link, but any other trainings will require registration in Workday. And we have had some issues with um, people not being able to access the trainings, and that's generally been related to affiliation. And so um, I would double check your affiliation if you have any trouble and it will need to be a Department of Human Services affiliation. And feel free to reach out to me if you ever have any issues um, registering and I will put my email in the chat box here in a little bit. So then also there is a web page that we can share with people and their families that um, it has an introductory video from Lilia, our director, and it's also got this really cool video from Nick Casa. Um, he talks about uh, charting the life course framework and how that can help people plan. So that's pretty interesting. There's ONA fact sheets, um, rate models. It's available in different languages. And so just lots of um, additional tools and resources for people who are receiving services in their families. Sorry, my dog is sleeping and, and making lots of noise. I apologize. Um, and then Compass Project links. So we've got some that are specific. So this is the Compass Project um, overview and then one for individuals, case managers. Here's our training center. Here's rate models and here's service groups. So this would be a link that provides more information on what you uh, learned today. And then we have uh, seniors and disabilities. Um, this is for the ONA. And then here is a link for the ONA manual. 
So now we're going to move into the Q&A. And one of the things that we've found that is helpful in the past, especially with 347 attendees today, is if you can either raise your hand and we'll call on people in turn or add your question in the chat box, and then we can answer them as they come up. So feel free to go ahead and put your questions in the chat box or raise your hand and we will um, get to your questions. And Rose and Mike are going to be available to answer the questions that you have. So I'll hand that over to them. And Teresa, it looks like we're getting quite a few questions coming in. <clears throat> Okay, so Rose and Mike, are you there? It looks like the first one says, this is from Jeff, it says, with case management required to be conflict-free from rate setting, will ODDS be providing information and technical assistance to families and providers around the rate models to assist with maintaining the conflict-free uh, requirement? Um, I'm fully sure I understand. Um, there shouldn't be a conflict between case managers and rates since the department sets the rates, although we are reaching out to families about the rates that their providers are going to be paid. Um, one of the reports out of Express I didn't mention is a, a letter that will be able to be printed out that shows what service group a person is and for the services they're receiving what the rates being paid to the provider are. And off the top of my head, I cannot remember the name of that report. but. Um, we're trying to be, again, as transparent as we can with all of this. Um, and in addition to that letter, uh, we, are, we do have trainings, like Teresa just mentioned, directed at families and people getting services that do discuss um, this whole rate process. Yep, and some of that information was included in the ONA training yesterday for people and families. And so we are sharing that information with them as well. We've also had uh, compass overview trainings for people and families. We'll also be doing another one of those in March in the evening, so it's more accessible. And then that will be recorded as well and added online. So we are doing um, our very best to try to to be as transparent, like Mike said, and share that information with people and families. So it looks like Jared has a question. The current rate model, oh, I think, did I miss one? Nope. Okay, so Jared says the current rate model includes rates for five to nine and nine or more. Will these settings, oh, these settings were not covered. Will there be a rate for those settings still July 1st? Or if not, will there be a transition period for those programs? So I'll take this. Um, so for those higher capacity homes, um, there is going to be an adjustment to um, the new rate and that transition will happen July 1st as well. Um, and so I will look to find, I don't know if the numbers are in our rate models that we have published on Compass um, or following up with that, but those will transition July 1st as well. And there will be no reductions with that. Um, I'm actually putting into the chat a link to our Compass page on the provider rate models page. Um, under the table that has the service group and payment categories, there's the new rate model links and there's a link that is actually that full Burns and Associates report that shows our rate models and all of those assumptions built in. And then there's also a link for the 24 hour rate exceptions training video that we did previously as kind of a general overview of um, the exceptions and how those will look. So I'm putting that into the chat right now. Fantastic. Thank you, Rose. It looks like Ariel has a question. When will we know what the rates are going to look like? Uh, you can know now. The link that Rose was just talking about will show what all of those uh, rates are for the various services that are going to be impacted on July 1st. Fantastic. Um, Andre has a question. Will the auto-populated claim be based on the daily rate or monthly average? I believe that's the different, daily. Yeah, well, different services have different units. So 24 hour residential, for example, is going to be a daily unit. Uh, some of the employment services like you know, small group employment and job coaching are hourly. I, I don't think any of the new rates are going to be monthly. I, I think monthly is going to, well, except for maybe supported living, that's still yet to be determined. But yeah, um, most of the, all the services affected on July 1st will no longer have a, a monthly component to them. 
Okay, and then Terry has a question. Is SE 50 and 53 going into POC? 50 for sure, July 1st. I don't remember, maybe Rose, do you remember is transportation on July 1st? The plan is for them all to eventually. I don't know if transportation is going July 1st. I think that's still the intention. Um, you know, things are getting to the wire and there's last minute adjustments because it's it's quite complex when we look at the system overhaul, but I do believe the intention is July 1st. All right, and I will mention that there have been some changes with transportation. And if you're interested in finding out more about that, you can go to the Compass Training Center and go to past recordings. And the Compass 100 for CMEs and providers includes some information on that. It's towards the end if you want to skip through the rest of it. Um, and then Joanna asks, is there unbundling for RN delegation and training services as well as direct nursing services? And what will that training look like? So direct nursing services is going to be unbundled and that, that's quite a separate service. So direct nursing is a service where there's actually like a criteria and eligibility and then that service is structured separately. As far as the other components, um, I do believe there is some level of assumption in the rate model for 24 hour of, I think it's called like specialized supports or, or something like that. I apologize, I'm not, don't have the model in front of me. Um, but there is some room for that capacity of areas of delegation and training and support around that. Um, so that's where that would be considered in that budget. Great, thank you, Rose. Um, and just so that everybody, um, just as a reminder is that we will have an unbundling training for direct nursing services in March. It, you are able to register for it right now and our subject matter expert for that, Ken Ralph will actually be conducting that presentation. And that will be recorded as well. So if you're unable to make that training, it will be recorded and on the Compass Training uh, Center website, it'll be under past trainings. So then Sasha has a question. We have several customers who have significantly lower hours via the ONA than the ANA. So 125 versus 300. Will ODDS be looking at the impact for these customers? Uh, again, I want to emphasize that nothing about hours is changing July 1st. That the date that that's happening has yet to be determined. Uh, but in developing the hours that are associated with the service group, we do know that some people will experience potentially a reduction. Um, if their service needs genuinely cannot be met within the hours available to them, then they would be um, needing to apply for an exception. All right, great. And uh, Rose actually will be doing an exceptions training on uh, the 22nd, so next week. So that is also available for registration as well. Um, so Jeff has a question with the auditing requirement indicated in the slides, will this be a responsibility of state licensing staff? So I guess I was trying to be clear that we're not like auditing in a way of we're looking hour by hour. What we're looking at is in general, do the resources match? Are people's needs being met? Um, but we are expecting that licensing is probably is going to be looking at, at that home and how resources are applied to meet individual support needs. Um, so it's, it's essentially, we don't want to have to have services coordinators going into the home and looking at, you know, okay, here's the rate model and let me count the staff and does it all match up? We really want to look at that bigger picture of our people's needs being met in the home. And is there really a balance between what the resources allocated to that provider and to that individual? And does that match the support being delivered? Okay, thank you. Um, Jared says, thank you, Rose. I had previously seen those, but since they weren't covered, I wanted to verify. Um, and then Netta had a question. If I have a client with an exception for their employment or DSA rates, when would that need to be renewed? 7-1 or at ISP renewal? Uh, we'll be doing those leading up to July 1st. So I, I, when do we open that up? April, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, April, we'll start looking at exceptional rates in April. And then that all that timeline for exceptions, Rose will also cover in the training next week. So it will tell you um, what the the not the deadline, but the date to prioritize those for the 7-1-2022 date will be. So if you have additional questions about that, that might be a good training to attend or at least um, watch the webinar when it's posted. 
Um, and if it's okay, Teresa, I mean, I'm going to go ahead and give a little sneak peek preview um, just because it's, <laughs> it's open, like timing wise. Um, we are opening up that kind of prioritized dedicated resources to those exceptions in preparation of the new rate model implementation July 1st um, from April 1st through May 31st. So we really want to focus that concentrated time. And there's several reasons why I know it feels very compressed, but we want to make sure that the um, determinations are based on the most current and accurate support needs going into July. So we can't backdate too far, or then we run the risk of things not feeling as, as fresh <laughs> or as current or as accurate. We also are looking at logistics. Our um, exceptions form has been completely revamped, updated. It's in the final stages of <laughs> with our publications who are doing amazing work so that hopefully the process is going to be much improved for people as far as lessening the amount of documentation, having better targeted questions, and allowing one form to cover all the exceptions one person might have. So those are things that we will talk about in greater detail, but be prepared. Those trainings are coming out. There'll be lots of resources, and then we will be like all hands on deck helping process those so that if you're um, submitting an exception between April 1st and May 31st, our commitment is to have those decisions prior to that implementation date of July 1st. So thank you, Teresa, for letting me just get that in. <laughs> no, I think that was great. Thank you. Um, let's see. So then we have a question. Okay, so Terry has a question that says, who will be responsible for getting all the existing SE50 and 53 CPAs into plan of care? So my understanding is um, it's been a while back, but as long as everyone has that like structure built into Express, our team is able to go through and do this kind of transition over that builds that. So that will be something that's that's an automated thing for the field um, that should be occurring. Great, thank you. And then Marla asks the final rate models, oh, the final rate models it is divided by tier when looking at the daily rate for adult 24 hour residential. Are the current tiers translating into the four payment categories? Okay, I'm a little unclear on that question, but I will say the word tiers, like tiers is going away. No more tiers, tiers is assist thing. So we are gonna have our service groups and those translate to the four payment categories. So again, there has to be the ONA, the SIS will no longer have any, any measure into somebody's rate or assessment. It's going to be the ONA. The ONA sets a service group of one through five. Those service groups then translate to the four payment categories. Now, the four payment categories vary by capacity of the home. For adults, we have a one to three structure and a four to five capacity structure. There's a slightly different structure for more than five that we mentioned earlier. Um, that's not necessarily generated through the Burns and Associates models. It's more of a carryover and transition into that express plan of care. All right, and I don't see any more questions coming through, but we'll give everybody a minute. Um, Debbie or Narina, do, do you see anybody with their hand raised? Right now, no, but I just see another. Oh, yep, Netta, okay. Yep. Is there a cheat sheet? Oh, I love that. Or a simple matrix for the new employment or DSA rate starting 7-1 for in-home services. The rate model is very comprehensive and not easy to look at. Yeah, so um, I'll be updating the expenditure guidelines with all of the new rates. Um, it should be posted for, on the engagements and innovation page probably. Um, I don't know, maybe May sometime. I, we have a timeline for all these things. I can't remember when all of the due dates are, but that will be the place, even though Express is gonna auto-populate rates, um, the expenditure guidelines is gonna be our, our, the place where we publish them publicly. Okay, and it appears Jeff has his hand up. Jeff Snedden. So Rose, this goes back to the question you were, you were just talking about. When you're talking about the tiers, so when you, the the link that you provided in the chat for the the Burns and Associates, so I mean, what the question Marna was asking is like currently that is broken down into six tiers. So do you know how those tiers are integrated into the four rate setting categories? I'm gonna have to look back at that again because I'm I'm not clear. Okay. 
Because that, that's where the confusion is coming in, I think. When we're looking at this, we're trying to crosswalk that to the, the form payment. I don't think it is, there's okay. much value in doing a crosswalk. I mean, this is more of a hard restart. Um, this, you know, whatever tier assist determined is no longer in effect after June 30th. On July 1st, the ONA and the service groups and associated payment categories take over. Um, there, there really is no relationship between the tiers and the payment categories. And Jeff, I'm now seeing what you meant. Um, I think when we look at the tables, each category then has like a tier and tier number listed under that. And um, I, I honestly don't under totally understand why it's notated that way. I would say disregard that tier component. Um, I think that's a holdover from previous work when there was an attempt to translate. But my understanding is that you just want to look at those simply as category one, two, three, and four, and not attempt to do any kind of translation. So I apologize. I, I didn't realize or note that those were there. I just was looking at the category numbers. So if that's what you meant, ignore the little tiers in the parentheses. I honestly don't know why those are there other than maybe to create confusion at this point. My apologies. So great. So just to make sure, so we just look at the final column then and just it's one, two, three, four, right? Yes, correct. It's just Got one, it. two, three, and four. Yeah. Don't even try to translate it here. I'm again, not sure why that's there. And I'll definitely um, provide that feedback that maybe that's something that should eventually come off of that. Well, Mike's going to update the, 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 the guidelines. So that'll be fine. It should be in there then. Thanks. All right, so it looks like we have another question. If Express auto populates the rates and a new ONA is done and the service group changes, when does that rate go into effect? The date the ONA is approved or the first of the following month? Increases will happen immediately. Decreases go into effect the first of the month after the month that the ONA was conducted. So say for example, today, February 16th, if I conduct an ONA and the rate goes down, the new lower rate will go into effect April 1st. So there's always at least one month of the old rate in effect. And we will actually have written communication and a guide for those kind of, I call it the rates and dates um, coming out fairly soon. All right, and then we have a comment from Patrick. And Patrick, I'm not sure if this is part of a question or in response, it says the value is in maintaining existing funding for homes that are already established. That was specific to the why tiers matter because people are needing to understand the funding base today and how it's gonna be impacted. Well, service groups are known at this point, as are the rates associated with their assigned service group. Um, so it should be a relatively easy thing to match the person with the rate. Virtually all, vast majority of rates will be going up. And again, just adding in that little reminder, if you haven't heard it 20 times already today, um, but we will have a session on those exceptions um, coming up next week, actually. And there's also resources online. So we do plan a very robust exceptions process. Again, ideally, because there is going to be um, increases for most people, um, we're hoping that, you know, not everybody's going to need an exception, but we understand there's unique circumstances and areas where additional resources are needed. And so we have a lot of resources invested, both um, staff resources and process to help that along as much as possible. Thank you for that. Um, let's see. Uh, so Ariel asks, will the daily rates change based on the needs of other individuals in the home and how many staffing hours are they sharing? So this um, is, I'm guessing is in regards to exceptions. So the daily rates, um, first of all, was like that table we showed in earlier in the presentation, which gives those staffing assumptions um, for maintaining the staffing in the home. And then there's those times that can be dedicated to one-on-one. -on -one. Um, with exceptions, our calculator that we look at is actually going to take and um, let's say somebody needs 
24 hours of support. It's going to take um, and discount the shared staffing um, from those one on one hours needed so that we're able to, again, keep that staffing resource in place for the rest of the home and then make sure that that person has the one-on-one -on -one support they need. So we have an exceptions calculator that we'll go through in that exceptions training, but there is definitely a um, look and consideration that these are homes shared with resources shared amongst multiple individuals living in the home. However, the rates themselves then will be individualized and will travel with that individual. All right. Thank you. Um, so there is a question from Jeff that asks, will there be consistency across provider types to prevent disparity between provider types? So for example, PSW versus DSP. I'm not sure I understand what that's getting at. Each of the agency rates are, you know, we've spent a long time working with our contractor Burns and Associates to come up with a rate for each of the different services. and. You know, if you take a look at the detailed models that Rose linked to, you can see, you know, how we got to the bottom line. Um, so we think that the agency rates are all pretty good. I mean, they were based on lots of conversations with providers and surveys and data analysis and a whole, you know, a range of sources fed into the generation of those rates. Um, so we think they're fair and good. Um, and PSW rates, I'm sure you know, are collectively bargained. So they are somewhat out of our hands. So I don't think it, it, there's an easy way to equate PSW wages and DSP wages. Okay, and we have another question. We can see the service levels in Express along with the enhanced yes or no. Can this information be added to the one page summary of the level of care or the ONA that we can print out? I don't have the answer to that question. Maybe, um, you can send an email to Linda Dar if you have her email. She is our ONA manager. And if y'all want to give me a moment, I will put Linda's email address in the chat box. All right. So, uh, Debbie and Narina, can would you be able to do an, a check for hands? I am doing that right now. Thank you. Let's see. I am not seeing any hands up right now. Okay, so we'll give everybody just a minute or two um, to see if there's anything that comes to mind if they have any questions. Oh, thank you, Rose. Rose added Linda's email in the, the chat box. So I'm going to go ahead and move us to um, our survey monkey. So this is the post course evaluation. So this is just, um, oh, thanks, Linda. Linda's here. <laughs> <laughs> um, this link is um, a serve, it will take you to a survey to evaluate the overall course. And again, this is really helpful for us to help improve the training that we offer to not only CMEs and providers, but also people and families. So your feedback is really important to us and we really do read every single survey. So we would appreciate if you could take a few minutes and complete that survey and we will hang on and give you some time to do that. And if any other questions come up, will be here to answer, but we will give you some quiet time um, to go ahead and complete that survey. Bree said there you. is one question sitting out there, just to let you know. And then I also put the survey monkey link in the chat.
I wanted to uh, share that there is a question from Sheila. It says, can the service levels be seen for employment in Express? The service groups are independent of service type. So a person in the service group is the same for their residential rates, for the employment services. Um, every rate that is dependent on the service group uses the same service group that the person is assigned to. Teresa, Sheila has another question. Oh, perfect. Okay, so so where in Express are they found? Um, the, the service groups are found, uh, like I said, there's a transmittal and a help Express help guide to find service groups. So I would refer you to those and rates will show up in Express on July 1st. And like I said, the expenditure guidelines will be published with the those rates uh, leading up to the July 1st. All right, well, it's 10.05. And so I, we're hoping that everybody was able to access the SurveyMonkey link to the evaluation. Let us know if you were not able to do that. Um, but otherwise, we appreciate you joining us today. It was really important for us to get this information out and we appreciate your time. We know you are all very busy. Um, and so again, we wanna say that this is gonna be recorded. This was recorded and will be on the Compass Training Center website. So if somebody was not able to make it today, they can go and watch that recording. So thank you all very much. Um, there is some information in the chat um, to service groups, uh, Linda Dar's email. I also put my email address in there if you have questions about registering. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much. And we appreciate you joining us today. Thank you.